Our new book, The Art of Business Wars, features stories and lessons from history's greatest business rivalries, with powerful insights uncovered through hundreds of episodes of Business Wars. Go to wondery.com forward slash the art of business wars to order your copy now. Join Wondery Plus to listen to Business Wars one week early and ad free in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. A note to listeners this episode contains adult content and language. It's 1952 in Salt Lake City, Utah. Pete Harmon unscrews a broken switchplate on the walk-in cooler of his cafe. Harmon is 33 and beefy from years of working the grill in restaurants. But despite working a long day in a hot kitchen, his white button-down is spotless and his khakis still hold a crease. He was raised by his aunt after his mother died of the Spanish flu, and Aunt Carrie was a stickler for cleanliness. Harmon feels a tap on his shoulder and turns around. He's astonished to see the odd old geezer in the frock coat and string tie that he met last year at the National Restaurant Association's conference. Why, Harlan Sanders, what are you doing in my cooler? Sanders is 62, but more energetic than ever. I'm headed to Australia. Some son of a bitch minister there says he can help people break sinful habits like my infernal cussing. Anyway, I have a bastard of a layover, so I thought I'd come see you. (laughs) Despite his cussing, Sanders is religious. So is Harmon, who grew up the youngest of 14 children in a Mormon family. He was raised to be a generous host. Well, Harlan, isn't that a blessing? I'd be happy to show you the sights and take you out for dinner. But Sanders shakes his head. He has an ulterior motive for this trip. He's impressed with how quickly Harmon has grown a small root beer stand into a thriving family restaurant. Sanders wants to create a fried chicken franchise. He figures if this smart young man goes for his pitch and serves Sanders' secret recipe chicken in his restaurant, others might too. Pete, that's damn kind of you, but I want to cook for you and your wife. Remember that pressure cooker chicken recipe I told you I was struggling with? Well, I finally figured out the son of a bitch. Let me show you how. Harmon looks at his watch. It's already five o'clock, but he doesn't want to hurt the old guy's feelings. They pile into Harmon's car and drive all over town tracking down ingredients. Most importantly, they get a pressure cooker. Back at Harmon's house, Sanders hits a snag. The stove's weak burners take forever to get the oil in the pressure cooker up to the required 400 degrees for frying. Harmon's wife pops her head in the kitchen and motions for him to come out. I'm starving. Are we ever going to eat? I'm sorry, honey. He wants me to buy his crazy fried chicken recipe, so he wants everything to be perfect. But listen, whatever it tastes like, let's not commit to anything. Finally, at 10 o'clock, Sanders emerges from the kitchen with platters of chicken, mashed potatoes, and collard greens. Harmon's wife waits until he goes to fetch something in the kitchen then leans over to her husband to vent. All that time for this? It looks like greasy diner chicken to me. Sanders returns with biscuits and gravy and sets them down on the table. Dig in, everybody. Harmon's wife picks up a drumstick and tentatively takes a bite. Her eyes widen in surprise. The chicken's coating is so crisp it crackles. Sanders turns to Harmon. Well, Pete... Is that the best goddamn chicken you've ever had? Hmm, it sure is different than what I'm used to. In fact, Harmon finds the chicken so tasty that his wheels start spinning. He's been looking for a signature dish to make his restaurant stand out from all the other burger joints. Sanders' chicken might be just the thing. But Harmon wants to get all his ducks in a row before he negotiates a deal. He sees Sanders off on his trip to Australia without ever tipping his hand. 30,000 feet above the Pacific, Harlan Sanders panics. He's convinced Pete Harmon hates his cooking and doesn't want anything to do with his fried chicken franchise. But while Sanders is trying to exercise his spiritual demons in Australia, hell is about to visit him in Kentucky.
from Wondery. I'm David Brown, and this is Business Wars. In the last episode, a young Harlan Sanders suffered through an impoverished childhood, then faked and fought his way into a series of dead-end jobs. Now, nearing retirement age, he's about to face the loss of his motel and restaurant. The state is considering rerouting the highway that's brought a steady stream of customers to his door for the past 20 years. And Sanders is having a tough time getting his chicken business off the ground. But in Georgia, Truett Cathy has expanded his initial tiny diner into two thriving restaurants serving American home cooking, and he's getting valuable experience he'll soon apply to building his own southern fried chicken franchise, Chick-fil-A. This is Episode 3, The Birth of the Bucket. The day after Sanders leaves for Australia, Pete Harmon is still savoring the chicken dinner Sanders served up. He goes to the hardware store, buys four pressure cookers, and then calls his sign painter. Don, I need you to paint a sign across my front windows. All 40 feet of them. I want to push a new fried chicken menu item. Hard. Okay, boss. What should the sign say? I don't know. Uh, how about Utah Fried Chicken? Hmm. Honestly, Pete, that, that doesn't have much zing. How'd you come up with the recipe? Maybe that'll give you an idea for the name. Harmon thinks about Sanders' weird colonel gimmick. I'm getting it from a strange guy who dresses like a Kentucky colonel from the old comic strips. And now that I think about it, I've never been to Kentucky, but it does make me think of southern hospitality. And good food. That's it. Why don't you just call it Kentucky Fried Chicken? Two weeks later, Sanders returns from Australia as foul-mouthed as ever and heads straight to Salt Lake City. All he cares about right now is what Pete Harmon thinks of his cooking. He hops out of his cab in front of Harmon's cafe and drops his suitcase on the sidewalk, dumbstruck. There, across the whole glass facade of the restaurant, is the biggest sign he's ever seen. Letters five feet high spell out Colonel Sanders Kentucky Fried Chicken. There's even a portrait of him with a white goatee and a string tie. And better yet, there's a line of people staking around the block waiting to get the new $1 fried chicken dinner. He shakes his head in disbelief. Well, I'll be a doggone son of a bitch. Here he is telling the whole goddamn city how good my chicken is. Ha, <laughs> I guess this franchising idea might just work out after all. That day, Sanders sells Harmon his secret recipe and gives him the rights to develop a franchise in Utah. Harmon agrees to pay Sanders a nickel for each chicken he sells. Then, they drive to Harmon's attorneys and together they trademark Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's a triumph for Sanders, but he won't be able to celebrate for long. It's 1956, inside Sanders' Court Restaurant in Corbin, Kentucky. Scores of business folk and curious locals pack the main dining room. The entire business and all its trappings are up for sale. A man in a brown suit and tie stands on a chair near the kitchen. He shuffles to the last page of paper on his clipboard. Folks, this is the last item up for sale in the auction today. It's beautiful Victor Cash Register in cherry red. Bidding starts at $20 for this item. Do I hear 20? No. No, do I hear 20? No. No one? Folks, this is a gorgeous piece of machinery. How about 15? I see you, Chester. We have a going bid of 15. Would anyone give 16? 16 dollars. 16. Last chance. Going, going, gone to Chester Williams there for the grand total of 15 dollars. Sanders skulks in the corner of the dining room, his wife next to him. He's 66 now and no longer needs to dye his hair white to look like the colonel. He whispers angrily in Claudia's ear. 
These goddamn cheap sons of bitches. They're fleecing me alive. Claudia rubs her husband's arm to soothe him. But it doesn't change the fact that the governor essentially drove Sanders out of business. With the new highway diversion, there's no easy way to bring tourists to their doorstep. Look, while you've been cussing and fussing, I've been adding up today's take. We've made $75,000 on the auction and real estate. It's enough to pay off our taxes and our debts, and we'll avoid bankruptcy court. But nothing extra. You only get $105 a month Social Security. What are we going to live on? Sanders takes stock of their situation. It's brutal. He realizes their only real hope is to franchise his chicken. If that doesn't work, they'll lose their house, too. Six months later in Wyatt, Indiana, a small town 15 miles from South Bend, Sanders lies curled up on the back seat of his Cadillac. He's parked in a field outside of town. He shakes himself awake, pulls on a pair of pants, drives to a gas station, and splashes cold water on his face in the restroom. Then, he dresses up in his full colonel costume, white shirt, black frock coat, and a string tie. He drives to a local diner, pulls his pressure cooker and a bag marked Secret Spice Mix out of the trunk, and enters the restaurant. He plops the bag down on the counter in front of a man in a grease-stained apron. Good morning. I'm Colonel Harlan Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken, and I have a secret recipe flour mix I'm selling to restaurants and cafes around the country. You the grill cook or the owner? The man wipes down the counter with a rag. I'm both. And mister, we already got what we need to fry chicken. Just plain flour works fine. But Sanders presses on. Look, I'm happy to fry up my own chickens to show you just what my special spice mix can do for your business. I can give them away free to your customers. The man rubs his stubbled chin. Well, I don't turn away nothing free. Sanders makes a big show of the cooking demonstration, and the customers love their free samples. At the end of the day, the owner agrees to buy Sanders' spice mix on a regular schedule and pay him four cents for every chicken meal sold. A simple handshake seals the deal. Today was a success, but often Sanders gets shooed away at the door. People don't know what to think of his corny colonel getup or this unheard of dish called Kentucky Fried Chicken. But within the year, the colonel's persistence pays off. Soon, he has more than 100 restaurants selling his recipe. And even better, the ever-inventive Pete Harmon is building the Kentucky Fried Chicken brand in Utah. And Harmon is about to stumble onto a marketing gimmick that will become just as iconic as Colonel Sanders himself. It's 1957 in Harmon's Cafe in Salt Lake City. Harmon answers his office phone. Hello? Hi, Pete. It's Harlan. One of my franchisees in Colorado has a problem. He bought 500 plastic buckets for a chicken promotion, but now the poor son of a bitch, his wife's in the hospital, so he called the whole thing off and he needs to unload these damn things. Can you use these buckets at any of your stores? Harmon fiddles with a pencil on his desk. He's thinking. Actually, my competition has a really popular prime rib dinner for three fifty. I need a special meal that could beat that and feed a big Mormon family for that same price. You know, what if I fill those buckets with fried chicken to go? Then a family could watch their favorite shows on TV while they eat. <laughs> Pete, that's a fine idea. And say, maybe add some biscuits and gravy to the bucket. You know, bulk it up some. Harmon buys the 500 buckets. He fiddles around with the perfect number of pieces to put in each bucket and lands on 14. The addition of biscuits and gravy gives the bucket a nice heft and still leaves him a generous profit margin. He advertises the $3.50 bucket meal on 100 small billboards all over town. The buckets sell out in two days. By the weekend, he has to fly in a shipment from Los Angeles. The bucket is a bonanza. 
But Kentucky Fried Chicken isn't the only company taking advantage of Americans' growing interest in takeout food. In Georgia, Truett Cathy is taking notes on the success of the Colonel and the new fast food chain called McDonald's. And he's working on his own secret fried chicken recipe. He'll pit his specially prepared breast against the bucket. We've rolled the clocks forward. Spring is springing, and you know what that means. That's right. It's time to get the lawn back on track. You know, the last thing anyone needs is another complicated or toxic lawn product. That's why I'm happy to tell you about our sponsor, Sunday. They're more than just a lawn care product. It's actually a customized lawn plan that works with nature. They take out all the guesswork and the unwanted chemicals so you can grow a beautiful, healthy lawn that's better for people, pets, and the planet. All you have to do is go to GetSunday.com, put in your home address, and their free lawn analysis tool takes over, and it takes care of the rest in just seconds. It's actually fun to use. When the package from Sunday arrived on our front porch, the first thing my wife noticed was all the ingredients that you can actually pronounce, you know, like seaweed, iron, molasses. You don't feel guilty treating your lawn with a cornucopia of dangerous chemicals. And when it's time to do all the work, it just doesn't get any easier. All I have to do is attach the ready-to-use pouch to a garden hose and spray. A whole day's work went down to less than 15 minutes. Come on, let Sunday take the guesswork out of growing a greener, more beautiful lawn this spring. Visit GetSunday.com BW to get $20 off your custom lawn plan at checkout. That's 20 bucks off your custom plan at GetSunday.com BW. You're going to love the look of your lawn. I don't know about you. But in the past year, mealtime has gotten to be a little bit more important at our house. There's nothing I like more than sitting around the table without all our devices and just catching up on everyone's day. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, our sponsor, Butcher Box, helps you make mealtime moments feel special the whole year round. Butcher Box is the most affordable and convenient way to get really healthy, humanely raised meat. Every month, they ship a curated selection of high quality meat without antibiotics and hormones, right to our front door. It's packed fresh, shipped frozen, and vacuum-sealed so it stays that way. And they've got lots of delicious options, too, like 100% grass-fed and finished beef. More on that in just a moment. But they've got free-range organic chicken, heritage pork, wild-caught Alaskan salmon, and sugar and nitrate-free bacon, which my son loves. And they even have free shipping nationwide, except Alaska and Hawaii. Now, my favorite part of the Butcher Box experience is the quality and the consistency. 100% grass-fed is important to us on the beef. You just can't get this quality at the local supermarket, not us. The feel-good about serving this to the family, (laughs) it's off the charts. And the kids notice the difference. It's fresher and more flavorful. Right now, Butcher Box is offering new members ground beef for life. You heard me right. That's two pounds of ground beef in every box for the life of their subscription. Just go to butcherbox.com slash BW. That's butcherbox.com slash BW. You're going to enjoy Butcher Box. It's 1959 in the television studios of KPHO, Phoenix, Arizona. The on-air light flashes red, and the cameraman cues a gentleman in a sports jacket sitting on a stuffed chair. We hope you've enjoyed today's afternoon movie, The Animal Kingdom. And now an ad from our sponsor, Harmon's Red Barn Restaurant. The camera swivels to a man in a chef's apron, standing at a microphone. He's the manager of a restaurant owned by Pete Harmon's older brother, Dave. The manager smiles into the camera and holds up a red and white bucket of fried chicken. Hi, folks. My name is Ken Harbo, manager of Harmon's Red Barn Restaurant, where we serve the best food in the Phoenix area. That includes our Kentucky Fried Chicken Dinner. It's the freshest, the crispiest, and the juiciest chicken you've ever had. So come on down to Harmon's Red Barn at 1314 East Tempe Boulevard and get the chicken family bucket meal for just $3.50. The cameraman zooms in on the bucket to close out the segment. But easily visible in the background of the shot is manager Dave Harmon, who gnaws on a drumstick and licks every tasty morsel from his fingers. The on-air light turns off, 
and Ken turns eagerly to his boss. How'd that sound to you? Dave gives him a thumbs up and keeps eating. A receptionist pops her head in the door of the studio. Someone's hopping mad on the phone, asking for the guy who just did the chicken commercial. Harbo picks up the receiver. How can I help you? I can't believe what I just saw on the television. Your commercial is a disgrace. That man eating chicken was licking his fingers. Well, lady, what can I say? I guess it's just finger licking good. Dave tells this story to his brother Pete, who has a brainstorm. He hangs a new banner on his panel truck that reads, Try Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's finger licking good. He drives his truck with a banner to the annual convention of the California Restaurant Association in San Francisco. When Sanders spots it, he's ecstatic. Pete, I've been saying that for years. The catchy phrase becomes the anchor for all of their advertising, and it provides the hook for Kentucky Fried Chicken's earliest television campaigns. You make history, we'll make dinner. Colonel Sanders already made history by fixing Sunday dinner seven days a week. And it's finger licking good. Pete Harmon now has five restaurants in Utah that all feature Colonel Sanders' Kentucky Fried Chicken. And in 1959, hundreds of diners, cafes, roadhouses, and family restaurants across a swath of the South and the Midwest do too. It's a loose family of franchisees built on a recipe and a handshake. But in Atlanta, restaurant owner Truett Cathy is innovating as well. In 1951, he opened a second dwarf house, and he's been making a name for himself ever since among workers from a nearby Ford plant and airline employees from the nearby municipal airport. He's working on a new fried chicken sandwich that is faster to prepare and even more portable than the Colonel's bucket. It's 1961 in Hapeville, Georgia. Truett Cathy sits at a table in his restaurant, The Dwarf House, a mug of coffee in front of him. He's 40 years old and bald as an egg. He's going over the menu for tomorrow's lunch rush. Two men dressed in khakis and button-down shirts join him. They're Jim and Hall Good, his chicken suppliers. Hey, fellas, what brings you here today? Jim and Hall often finish each other's sentences. Jim's the chatty one, and he starts first. Sure, we're in a fix. We contracted with Delta Airlines to supply them with boneless, skinless chicken breasts cut in little chunks to fit into those little plastic trays they use. Well, we delivered a big order to them, but the chicken pieces weren't the size they wanted, and now we're stuck with a mess of chicken pieces. Hall's the impatient one. We gotta unload them. Uh, would you have a use for them? Truett takes a sip of coffee. Hmm. I might just be able to help you. I I've been trying to figure out how to fry my chicken faster, but I never considered taking the bone out of the equation. You know, gentlemen, I think we can make a deal. When the Good Brothers' boneless pieces arrive, Truett goes into his kitchen and pulls out the new high-powered pressure cookers he just bought. After some trial and error, he can fry a boneless breast in just four minutes. That means he can serve his fried chicken fresh instead of cooking it ahead of time and keeping it in a warming cabinet or under a heating lamp. But the flat, unevenly shaped pieces look insubstantial on a plate. He takes a hamburger bun and nestles the chicken inside it. Better, but still not right. Truett experiments with the seasoning, the cooking method, and the presentation for more than a year. One day, he serves it on a buttered bun to one of his regulars. Honestly, True, it's good, but it's uh, a touch dry. Then Truett remembers how his mother fried her chicken years ago in the boarding house. She seasoned the meat and put it into the refrigerator overnight to seal in the flavor and juices. He tries this method out on customers too. And then, why not? He throws on some dill pickles too. Finally, after four years of tinkering, his favorite customer bites into his latest version. The customer wipes his mouth with his napkin and motions Truett over to his table. True, uh, promise me you won't change another thing with this chicken sandwich. I would eat that sandwich every day for the rest of my life. Soon, 
the new menu item he calls a chicken steak sandwich, is out selling hamburgers at the dwarf house. Truett knows he has a hit on his hands, but he's not getting any younger. He's already had a serious cancer scare. He doesn't want to expand, but franchising, like McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken, well, that appeals to him. All he needs is a catchy name. One night, he mulls it over with his wife. True, you know how some people confuse your chicken steak sandwich with chicken fried steak? That's a real problem. Yeah, maybe I should call it a chicken fillet sandwich or something. The fillet is the best cut of beef. Uh, I could shorten it to chick filet, and we could spell it with a capital A at the end, like grade A meat. Now, he just has to sell it. He introduces his Chick fil A sandwich to thousands of hungry convention goers at the 1964 Southeastern Restaurant Trade Association's gathering and walks away with 50 licensing agreements. Even Atlanta favorite Waffle House joins the stampede. The following year, Truett signs a star making deal to sell his sandwiches at the opening day of the brand new Houston Astrodome. Houston, the Chick fil A has landed. By this time in 1965, Harlan Sanders has hundreds of Kentucky Fried Chicken franchisees, so many he can't keep up with all the travel. He spends his time running around in his colonel suit, now all white because the television people tell him white makes him stand out better. But Harlan is ready to take his money off the table. He sells the business for $2 million and gets a small annual salary to be the face of the brand. But the way the new owners do business frustrates Harlan. And he's not about to hold his tongue. In the next episode, the colonel wages war on his own company, just as Chick-fil-A and the new upstart Popeyes gain ground in the race to feed America's growing appetite for fast-fried fowl. From Wondery, this is Episode 3 of KFC vs. Chick-fil-A for Business Wars. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review, and be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Apple Music, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen one week early and ad-free. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. If you support them, well, that helps us keep offering our shows for free. There's another way you can support the show, and that's by filling out a small survey at wondery.com slash survey. And make sure to tell us which business stories you'd like to hear. A quick note about recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said. Those scenes are dramatizations, but they are based on historical research. You know, we use many sources when researching our stories, but we especially recommend Josh Ozersky's Colonel Sanders and the American Dream and Secret Recipe by Robert Darden. I'm your host, David Brown. Barbara Bogay wrote this story. Karen Lowe is our senior producer and editor. Edited and produced by Emily Frost. Voice acting by Michelle Phillippe. Sound designed by Kyle Randall. Kate Young is our associate producer. Our executive producers are Jenny Lauer-Beckman and Marshall Louie. Created by Ernan Lopez for Wondering.